We've hit the bad and the ugly of SummerSlam. Now it's time to hit the good. Let's kick off our top 20 SummerSlam countdown. What's going on out there, guys? It's your boy Tommy on the spot for Watch Along Wrestling. Hope everyone is enjoying their SummerSlam weekend, getting ready for the biggest party of the summer this Sunday. All week long on the channel, we've been counting them down. The absolute worst SummerSlam, all the way to the best SummerSlam. And if it's your first time joining us on the channel, make sure you leave a big thumbs up, subscribe, and check out the comment section below because I will be listing the links to both parts one and parts two counting down the first 11 SummerSlams of all time so you can see which ones I ranked as the worst. But now, it's time to build it up to the best. All week long, we're going to get you down from the top 20 to the top 15 to the top 10 and then all the way on SummerSlam Sunday, the top 5 SummerSlam events of all time. Without any further ado, let's get to the top 20. Number 20, SummerSlam 2006. SummerSlam 2006 was actually based around one of my favorite rivalries of all time in WWE, John Cena vs. Edge. It was actually a lot of fun because of the fact that this rivalry had been built up over 8 months. Obviously at New Year's Revolution in the beginning of 2006, Edge was the first man ever to cash in the Money in the Bank contract and become the world champion and really instilled a lot of excitement with the rated R superstar type deal into the top mix and it was great to see him getting that shine at SummerSlam 2006. On top of that, this also had a pretty fun deal going on between Batista and King Booker because remember, these guys actually had a legitimate brawl backstage or at some party and now we're bringing this to light in an actual match on SummerSlam, so that was pretty exciting. On top of that, you had a really bloody, insane Legends brawl between Mick Foley and Ric Flair. So why is this all the way down at number 20? Well, that's really all you had on the show. Hulk Hogan was still on the show. He had a match against Randy Orton, inexplicably won this match. The match was also like third on the card and it just didn't do much for me. And if I'm being honest, I'm really not a fan of the revival of D-Generation X in 2006. Don't get me wrong, I love DX. The cutting edge of Generation X from 1998 till 2000, one of my favorite factions of all time. The revived version though in 2006, it felt like they went from something super cool to now they were kind of grown up and almost a little corny, which I realized was part of the deal, but it didn't do too much for me. Neither did their match with the McMahons on this show. SummerSlam 2006, bit of a mixed bag, but it kicks us off on our countdown today. Number 19, SummerSlam 2011. I'll be honest, this is not a show that I had the fondest of memories of, but I went back recently and watched it, and it's actually a really good show. That being said, at the time, it left one of the worst tastes in my mouth at the end of a show in quite some time. This was right at the summer of Punk, where CM Punk won the world title and then basically quit WWE and went off, and he had the title in his fridge, showed up at independent shows, and did pretty much whatever he wanted as the WWE Champion. And now here he was going up against the interim champion John Cena and what should have been a crowning achievement moment for CM Punk and a moment that really kind of solidified that this was now he was the face of WWE and it was now the CM Punk era as the world champion. He wins the match, he gets the belt, it's a feel good moment, and then who comes out of the crowd? Kevin Nash in 2011. Don't get me wrong, I was at the Royal Rumble 2011 and I was marking out for my boy Kevin Nash. I was ready to go, doot doot, diesel, all that. But I just did not want to see that happen. He comes out, he attacks Punk, and I'm like, all right, well, that's a weird ending. And then who should come out afterwards? Alberto Del Rio cashes in money in the bank, and we're all left pretty darn deflated. Aside from that, though, I will say that Randy Orton and Christian have a really underrated classic on this show. A no-holds-barred match, they absolutely kill it for about 23 plus minutes. And Mark Henry and Sheamus also have an underrated match for the world title that if you go back and watch, there's a little Easter egg. When Mark Henry goes and takes Sheamus and bulldozes him directly through the barricades, who is there but independent wrestling sensation Joey Ryan, who has one of the best, most incredible reactions to this of all time. Seriously, stop this, put it on pause, go watch that moment, and then come back and join us for the countdown. It's fantastic. Number 18, SummerSlam 2003. This show could have actually been a top 10 SummerSlam. I'll be honest, I'm even willing to forget the fact that The Undertaker was completely wasted on the show and put into a match with A-Train 
because there was some really good stuff on the show. Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle absolutely teared it up. Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Rhino, and Tajiri had a really fun Fatal 4-Way. And the main event was a fun Elimination Chamber match that was going about as good as you possibly could expect, especially as a revival of the Goldberg character since his WWE run got off to such a slow start. Now, I'm not a huge Goldberg fan. I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not really the biggest WCW fan. So, when Goldberg came to WWE, I wasn't into it. But in this particular match, I really was. They did an awesome job of portraying Goldberg as this monster who just ran through everyone, and everyone was waiting for that crowning moment of him to win the title, bulldoze through Triple H, and become the world champion for WWE, and then we're off to the races for the remainder of his run. He bulldozed through the first four participants of the match, Sledgehammer, and that was it. Goldberg loses, Triple H wins, and it ends up getting us to another time where Goldberg does eventually win the title, but for me, if that happened here, this would have been a top 10 SummerSlam. But again, like so many before it, the ending of SummerSlam left us just a bit flat. Number 17, SummerSlam 2005. This is a show that remains frustrating to this day because it was one of the best hype SummerSlams in quite some time. The build between Shawn Michaels and Hulk Hogan, the ultimate dream match, is something that I remember from the 4th of July of 2005, the super kick heard around the world, Shawn Michaels turns on Hulk Hogan, and it was just built up so well. On top of that, you also had the real-life drama between Matt Hardy and Edge, when Edge legitimately stole Matt Hardy's girlfriend, Lita. Matt Hardy went on social media, talked about this way before, like, actual social media existed. There was no Twitter, there was really not even Facebook yet. So, Matt Hardy goes ahead, he airs all their dirty laundry, he gets fired, eventually gets brought back, when he does get brought back, though, he starts talking about going to Ring of Honor, and then eventually ends up signing a contract with WWE, comes back for this big match with Edge. It's a match everyone's excited about. It doesn't really do much. Unfortunately, Matt Hardy gets knocked out by Edge, and not much else comes with this show. On top of that, there's also some strange stuff on this show. While I love Eddie Guerrero and I love Rey Mysterio, they have a ladder match for the custody of Dominic. On top of that, you I'm sorry? You don't, you don't remember the custody of Dominic ladder match? Who's Dominic? Dominic Mysterio, you've seen him. He's down in the corner of Rey Mysterio to this day. Well, at one point, he was a little kid, and the custody of said little kid was held up on top of a ladder, and Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero battled to see who was getting custody of Dominic. On top of that, you also had Kurt Angle facing off against Eugene for his Olympic medals, like a year after the Eugene hype had really faded off. And it's just a really strange use of Kurt Angle on this show. And while I thoroughly enjoyed the Hulk Hogan-Shawn Michaels match just because of the antics of Shawn Michaels, who was clearly in a bad mood that the proposed three-match series had been nixed and he was not going to be getting his win back over Hogan, so he just shows off and he goes and oversells every single move. And it's really entertaining, but at the end of the day, I can only go so far with the show. So that is SummerSlam 2005 here at number 17. Number 16, SummerSlam 1996. This is a situation where one of my personal favorite SummerSlams ends up here at number 16 because there really probably isn't too much memorable in terms of in-ring action. But if you were a fan of 1990s, mid-1990s WWE hokiness, you know, new generation, all that, this is really the show for you. It's a show that from the beginning where they just show all these random places of Cleveland they have the, the battle between the Godwins and the Smoking Guns where they race around the city of Cleveland to get back to the arena. You have this Ahmed Johnson update where he's just really recovering from surgery and he's got the Intercontinental title there and it's just super hokey even though it's a legitimate injury. And of course, the Bikini Beach Blast Off which happened on the pre-show of SummerSlam 1996 and featured all of the zany characters from the mid-90s. Uh, the, the, was that? I think the goon was there, uh, the plumber, T.L. Hopper was there, and he was pulling out Dookie out of the pool, swimming pool. It's a lot of fun, and it's a show that I just probably have watched a million times. I also love the main event on this show. It's Vader and Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels throws a great hissy fit in the middle when Vader doesn't move, and he yells at him. But that doesn't tear, totally take away from the fact that this was a pretty big dream match at the time and a match that they had done a really good job in building up Vader. 
Uh, would have been great to see this uh, continue and continue down the, the path that was supposed to happen in 1986, where Vader dethroning Shawn Michaels of the title at Survivor Series and getting a run as the world champion. Unfortunately, it wasn't in the cards. But that doesn't take away from the great match these guys had to main event SummerSlam 1996. And on top of that, you also had the Boiler Room Brawl between Undertaker and Mankind, which ended with a great twist of Paul Bear turning his back on The Undertaker. Really good show, SummerSlam 1996. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And that is going to do it for the first part of our top 20 SummerSlam events of all time. Is there anything I missed? Anything I rated too high? Let me know in the comment section below. And tomorrow morning, we'll be back with the start of the top 15 SummerSlam events of all time. As the late, great Gorilla Monsoon used to say, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. This has been a lot of fun, and I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. Until then, everybody, take care, and thanks so much for checking us out here on Watch Along Wrestling.